This is rather slimy, yeah. <laughs> so. Welcome! Eli and Lee again, back for some more good stuff. Um, okay, uh, we teach for the WTBA, Eli Montague, Lee Evans, senior instructors, all that good stuff. Um, okay, what we're going to be talking to you about today is, for starters, this is a very special video because this is our last ever video here. Um, this, as you may recognize, those of you who have followed our video series, this is our training platform at the Montague family home. Uh, we've been here for the last 15 years. This is where we moved to when we moved over to Europe, uh, in Wales, UK. Um, but my mother has finally sold this place and she's going to eventually be heading back to Australia. So this place is moving on to new owners. Uh, so this much loved training platform that Dad and I used to train on each day is uh, used for probably sitting and picnics and stuff like that. Anyway, this will be the last uh, yeah, the last video on this uh, very special training platform. So we thought we'd do something very special. And by very special, we're going to do something to do with the small sans sao. I'm not going to teach you the small sans sao. We're going to do some um, important training tips for your small sans sao training. Um, yeah. as, as you can see today, just a little bit uh, slippery. It's it's winter in Wales, and obviously the platform's not been used for a while. I'm living over in Malta now, and so it doesn't get used for training much anymore. Um, in which case, we you may notice us uh, sliding around a little bit. Anyway, first thing I want to get onto is the concept of the B side of the small sensor. Now, don't get excited too soon, because what I'm going to tell you on this video is don't do it. Okay, stop it. Just stop doing the B side. The B side is there for a specific purpose. It's a very important training exercise to put the B side into the movement. However, you must not do it as your main part of training and you must certainly not do it when someone is still learning the small sans sao. It should only be done at a later stage. The concept of the B side has been around, well, as far as I know, since Dad ever first started teaching the sand cell. I certainly have seen him do it on some of the videos even way back in the 80s and things like that. So it's always been there, but it's never been sort of pushed and promoted. Oh, I don't know, seven, eight years ago or something, I started actually talking about it a bit more and showing some of the methods in classes. Um, but ever since I showed them, people thought, oh, something new, got excited about it. And now it seems like people are a lot of the time only doing small sand cell with the B-side. Now, just a simple concept of what is the B-side. Obviously, there's always a B-side, the person who throws the punches for the person doing the techniques. What we mean by putting in the B-side is putting in the defensive actions as well, not just the attacks. So meaning the, the full B-side, um, the, the attack and the defense. But there's a very specific reason for doing these um, defensive actions. The main concept you have to remember with the B-side of small sense art training is that if I'm B and Lee is A, so Lee's doing small sensor, I'm throwing the punches for Lee. Okay. The absolute fundamental principle of my job is to teach Lee something. That's my job. Large sensor, this is where people have got confused. Um, by it being called a B side, people have thought, oh, okay, so it becomes like the large sensor. Well, no, it doesn't. The small sensor is never like the large sensor. It's a very different training exercise. The large sans you have an A side and a B side, and they are put together as a pairing, and you both have equal uh, attack defense scenarios throughout. So you're training for yourself and for your partner. The small sans is not that. The small sans has a defender, a person doing self-defense, protecting himself, and an attacker, an aggressor. And that's the B side is the aggressor. The A side is the person actually practicing small sans My job is to do whatever I can to get the best training out of my A side. So I don't want to train like, oh, okay, if I do this, this is better for me. I get better training. This is not, a, this is maybe not so, I don't like doing this punch, for example, because I feel too open. That's not a very effective punch on my part. But it's something that someone in the street will do. And if you've only ever come up with kind of really, really good boxer kind of punches, and someone swings a big haymaker, you're not used to that body motion. You Which have is the second to... most common attack in a street fight. Exactly. Yeah. Um, 
first is that? Is a push, yeah. yeah. First, first is, is a push. First is a push and the yeah. second is Which the, is also the in the small Yeah, yeah. So, um, so um, basically what we've got to look at is in self-defense training, the attacker has to do things that we would regard as martial artists as being stupid. I would never attack Lee with both my hands to his chest. What a stupid thing to do. If he defends that in whichever way, my whole guard is completely open. In the same aspect as if I throw a big swing puncher, that's so easy to block if you know how. But if you own if I only ever train Lee in fighting against a martial artist, in that I'm only ever gonna throw really good close range, close circle strikes, he only knows how to fight martial artists. He doesn't know how to strike fight some thug in the street. So Although on the one hand, technically it's more difficult to fight a martial artist, if that's all you're used to, you'll be out of your depth when you come up against something different. And that's why it's so important to train against everything. You know, we have to go and fight against grapplers, we have to fight against boxers, against kickboxers, against Muay Thai fighters, against people who don't know how to fight. And that's the most important, because the average guy who tries to swing at you in the street are the people who don't know how to fight. So, that's the point. My side as the B side, is to do things that I might not like for myself, but it's for his benefit. As opposed to large Sansao, by where the techniques, although they're beneficial to my partner to learn how to defend against them, every technique I do in the large Sansao is also for my benefit to learn that specific actual technique. So, when and why do we do the B side? Okay, I'm not going to teach you the B side here, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, this is just a simple, quick little tips and training techniques that we're putting up for free on YouTube. Um, so, first move as an example. Okay, let's say we're doing the first move, small sense out, and, and let's assuming Lee was a start beginner, I was teaching him the form. If we were doing the form and he's making any kind of errors whatsoever, doesn't matter what the error is, if he's making any slight error, we do not move on to putting anything else in until he has completed that and got his foundation correct. If he's doing it well, he's doing it grounded, he's doing it competently, and he's, he's moving correctly, then I'll add something extra. So this is then the B side. Now the B side has several different areas. It's not just one sequence of movements. And I'm just gonna use the first movement here to give you an idea of what is the B side, but I'm not gonna teach you the whole rest of the form. At a later stage, I will put out a complete proper MTG title uh, covering the whole of the B side and how to do it and the different methods. So, as I said, it's not just about me throwing a strike and blocking his arm because that's for my benefit. Oh, I'm learning how to block. Well, no, that's not, that's not helping him really. It's not doing anything for him. What I want to do is I want to test his structure by putting in a block. That's why I put in the block is to test his structure. So say, for example, I throw this punch, bang, and he, he does the strike to my neck. Now, I do the same punch again, but I put up a hinge bump, you see? And Lee's body, sure it shook, that's what should naturally happen, a little vibration goes through his body, but he stayed where he was. If, for example, if you do the strike, I can just, you, you do the block to me, do, do the strike and the, and the hinge block. Yeah, like right, so I'm striking here, actually let's do the other side, so the camera can see this is the yeah, side, okay. So, something like that, right? So I'm blocking this and I'm, I'm striking in here. Now, the reason that he's putting that there is to make sure that I am, for starters, grounded, so I'm not off balance, and also that I'm not pushing from my arm and from my shoulder. If he puts out that block, <clears throat> see? see how his body went a little bit up onto his toes? And mine didn't. That shows that boom, my body was grounded and I was pushing from my body. If, however, I do it like this, see, I've fallen backwards. Because now I didn't even hit that hard, but the power was in my triceps. And if the power's in my triceps, that's going to push me off balance. So this is the idea. He's training me. As I say, I'm not teaching you this method specifically now. I'm just showing you why we do it. I've taught this many times in, in workshops, so those of you who have learned it, you'll know how to do it. But that's the idea behind it. If I've got pure, good sinking and grounding, my arm bah, should just recoil back into my body and stay grounded. If I've got any motion, even 10% of my power, coming from my triceps or my shoulder, then that will cause me to get pushed off balance. Now, what will happen then is, and this is how the B-side works, you always have two methods. So, if say for example, let's say I'm throwing the punch at Lee, and I'm putting up this block. Now, if he's a beginner, because there's a pressure here now, he may start leaning forwards 
to counterbalance the fact that I'm pushing him backwards. So if you start doing the strike and leaning a bit, yeah, lean onto me like that as, as you do the method again, <clears throat> okay, so he's not falling over, but he's leaning forward. So if, <laughs> if I notice that as the teacher, because I'm the B side and the B side is always the teacher, if you lean on me again, see, I'll do a totally different block. I'll actually suck in with my blocking action. That way, he then learns, oh, okay, hang on, I've got to worry about balance this way and this way. So now when he does it, I'm going to be doing the opposite block, or opposite lock, the four-wheel drive shop in Australia. Um, so instead of bumping into his body to try to send him backwards, I'm sucking in this way. I'm not grabbing his arm and pulling him forward, that's a completely different method. I'm simply yielding, tapping down. I'm not pulling him off balance in this case. I'm simply throwing the punch and not being there by, by doing a block like this. Um, therefore, if he's even the slightest bit off balance, and what you've got to notice as the teacher, and I mean the student can notice it as well, don't just look at, oh, did I fall over? Did I fall forward? What you've got to look at, did his weight go onto his toes? If your weight goes on your toes, then if you upped that pressure to a, a serious situation, you probably would have fallen over. So when you're doing the small sansa, that's why we place so much importance on swivel on the heels, keep the weight in the heels. If you go, oh, oh I didn't fall over, but no, your weight went forward. Your weight went into your toes, therefore you were not fully grounded. So that's the concept. If I feel my student is in any way not grounded, I'll slam this hinge into him so that I can, oh, okay, no, actually he was grounded, didn't fall over. If I feel that he's leaning forward, I'll suck him forward this way and try to get his weight to come onto his toes. And he's got to be not only totally grounded in his core, but also loose in his arm. If he's got a lot of tension in his arm, when I hit his arm, he'll be put off balance. If he's got looseness in his arm, when it comes up like the folding principle, when I hit his arm, nothing should happen to his center. So that's the concept of the B side. I'll give you one other example, um, just because they're not all the same. Every technique, you're learning something different. So for example, when we do um, the, the low punches, uh, let's see, okay, so let's do the first low punch, so yeah, the first pump, right, okay, so here. Now, what's the most important thing here? Obviously, he's doing a two-handed block. That's not the best thing to be doing in a fighting situation, to use two hands to block someone's arm. We're assuming, in the small sanso, in this sense, that the guy's twice your size. So, you know, when I look at people like Lenny McLean in a fight, I'm just like, I'm sorry, if I had to fight him, I'd try to use three arms to block the damn thing. Because hes he literally weighs twice of me. He is two of me and pure muscle, not just a big fat guy. So I'd probably use two hands against his. Lee and I fighting each other, there's no, like, if ever you've seen any fights, like when Lee and I are sparring or anything, I don't think I've ever used a double-handed block and vice versa because there's no need to. You're much better off doing a single-handed block and using the other hand to instantly strike, of course. But small sansao is assuming worst-case scenario. So some of the blocks are one-handed, of course, so you get that training, but some of the blocks are two-handed in case you need it. So that's what it's there for. So what are we in danger of? The other hand, obviously. I'm, I'm not just going to throw one punch at the guy. So the most important thing from Lee's point of view, this is after you've learned the basic foundation, don't try to go fast too soon, I'm talking same principle as before, once he's not making any errors, he has to start moving quickly. So from that block, he's got to get to this strike as quickly as possible. If there's any delay, he would have been hit by the other punch. So my job now, once I see if you just do the, the block and the, and the yeah. punch, bang, bang, right? My job now is to try to hit him with this hand. So I throw my first, that's my B side. I throw my first punch, <laughs> you see? He gets me before I get him. Now don't start doing this when you see these kind of things. I see so many people and they come to a class and they're like, oh, but that's a terrible block because I could hit you with this hand. And they throw the punch like this, do the same thing again. They didn't even throw that strike. They just put their hand there, really, they were already throwing this punch. And as a good fighter, you'll notice that. You'll see that this is pissy. You'll notice there's no power in it, so you won't use two hands against it. You'll come straight in and barge in and attack me. But if, 
if you see, I'll try to sim. I can't really. I, I wanted to come charging <laughs> in at you, but it's going to be like a Looney Tunes thing. Um, if you see a big, <laughs> this kind of thing, a big, powerful movement coming in, that automatically slows down your second punch. But of course, there's more power in it. So you see that big coil of the body, you see the shoulder drop, you see the weight change. You're looking at that body, body language. That's what we look at as fighters. You see the way someone moves. If someone comes like, this is clearly the main shot, he's going to do that. You see, he's going to go straight to punk. Just block that with the one hand and attack me straight up. But if he doesn't see that there, if he says, what is this? Now he's going to have those two hands down there, you see, and then, then bounce off as he did then. Meaning that as soon as I've hit that, if he's done that block correctly, meaning he's slightly gone with that motion, you see, because that's how the block works, if you practice your small sense out correctly, he's going in, which pulls me slightly off balance. Now people think, oh, it's not going to throw you off balance. What I mean by pulling you off balance is the same as I said before, just putting the weight on the toe. That much difference will take just a few milliseconds off my second strike because I will either throw the punch now, in which case it's gonna have no power in it anyway, or I'm gonna go, whoops, and, and just in that split second where I have to regain my balance, he smacked me in the face. So that will give you that tiny little bit of an extra chance of landing that strike before I land my second strike. So, of course, in the sense of the B side and the small sand sound now, my second punch, I've got to have in my mind, I'm gonna throw a punch here and a second punch here. But as soon as I notice that's not going to work, my boom, it becomes a block, you see? So that's when, when some people learn it in the basic sense, they just go, okay, bang, bang, and just block the hand. But again, that's not teaching him anything. By me just going, that's not giving him any extra benefit. But if I try to hit him with that hand, that's then forcing him to be like, oh God, I've got to really get that hand up as quickly as possible. And what you'll notice, again, this is all the different ways that we train. If, say, for example, um, just put it in on this side. Let's say I've done that. Let's say I am too slow. Let's say this punch comes through and I sense that that's quicker than, <laughs> than my follow-up strike. I then have to instinctively maybe change it to this, for example. Now, that's not small sound, Sal. That's I've done a totally different strike. I would now regard that as I have made a mistake, right? I haven't done the right thing, but at least I've, I've protected myself. And this is what we've got to look at when we're training any forms, any set training methods. When we do large sansa, for example, I remember I would train that all the time with my dad. And especially when I was learning, if ever I would forget a move or be too slow or my guard would break or I'd fall over, whatever mistake I made, that would never stop. He would keep coming through with his second application. So I would just have to make something up so I wouldn't get hit because he wouldn't stop his punches. I mean, I'm not saying he would like knock me out, he wouldn't land a full powered punch, but he'd still definitely hit me and give me a good black eye or something. Um, so in which case I was always on my guard. So if I, if, if, I don't know, I was supposed to do slant flying and I went, oh shit, what's happening? I'd, I'd just do something. And when that happened, that would obviously register to dad, something's gone wrong, but he's protected himself. Okay, let's stop and start again now. Now we'll try it again and see if we don't make that mistake the second time. So it's all about training yourself to do the right thing. But if you get it wrong, your body still reacts with the, oh shit, save me method. Um, the what do you do if something goes wrong? Like our Dalui principle. Never let someone grab your arm and pull you forward. That, that's the stupid... Obviously, as soon as he touches, I, I should be out of there. I should never let him grab my arm. But what if he did? Never assume in a fight that you will do the right thing. People who say, oh, we don't need to train fighting on the ground because we'd never end up on the ground. Well, come on, you, you might. You might end up on the ground against a very good grappler. I've, I've sparred with certain people, and yeah, if you do the right thing, you hit them when they're here. You hit them when they're here before they get to you. But if they're a very competent uh, grappler, you're a very competent boxer, they've got just as much chance of taking you down as you have of taking them down. You're both equally skilled martial artists. In which case, you've got to have some idea of what to do when you get down uh, to the ground situation. A lot of people always used to think that Earl Montague never did ground fighting, but he did. He only used to say, never take a fight to the ground. That's what he said. 
never get into a fight and try to take him to the ground because that's no good for self-defense. Someone else might come and kick you in the head. Um, however, he did, he put out an entire video on what to do once you get down on the ground. MTG67. Um, that's volume one. 77, sorry. <laughs> 67 just deals with the first part. Hit him before he gets you. 77 then deals with if that doesn't work and you end up down here, this is what to do next. So that's the concept of the B-side. It's always there to teach your partner something. Now here's why we should not do it for beginners or not even do it as a, as a main area of training. It's a secondary area of training. You must always train both. If I throw my punch for Lee and I block, whichever block I do, it doesn't matter which one I do, if I block his hand every single time we train, he's effectively now not getting his Far Jing training. If I don't put the block in, do a full Far Jing yeah. movement, bah! you see, he's getting that, that nice recoil Far Jing action, even though he's not physically hitting me. If I stop him, bah! I've suffocated that Far Jing movement. I've stopped it before it's happened. Because obviously I'm not blocking him right on the apex of his movement. I'm going to be blocking him just before the apex of his movement, as I should, as a good defensive action does. In which case, he's then not actually doing Fa Jing. And what's one of the main purposes of practicing small sansa? To learn Fa Jing. So as soon as you start putting the blocks in, you're no longer learning how to do Fa Jing. That's why you must always, even, even when Lee and I train, now we're both been doing... I don't know, when did I start Small Sensor? 16, 17 years ago or something. You've probably been doing it 30 yeah, years or yeah. something like that. So we've been both doing Small Sensor for a really long time. But in fact, I would say most of the time we practice it without the blocks. Because that's actually the more important area of your training. The, the blocking part, doing the secondary section, that is your secondary area of training. Never make that your primary. That's the main focus of this particular lesson. Um, for me, I'd rather go up against a trained fighter any day of the week. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I've gone up, I had, had to through the line of my work and my life, gone up against absolute animals, people who are having psychotic episodes, and they're the worst. Mm. The person who is just swinging, screaming, biting, clawing, gouging you, that's the person that is most difficult to fight. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the B side of the small Sansa, is the person who's just throwing hay mail at, bailers at you without any care or attention. Mm -hmm. They don't care about getting hurt. They're just attacking him. Yeah, yeah. That's, even childhood, same example. Yeah. I could never fight girls when I was a kid. Mm. Yeah. Any time I would fight my male friends, even the friends who were my brother's age, who were three years older. So when you're little, that's a big mm. size difference. Whenever we'd be wrestling, mostly it would be wrestling, so you don't hurt each other. Um, but almost every time, I just always end up on the floor in a sleeper hole. I'd always get them into that sleeper hold and choke them out. Because obviously, as I say, we, we were kids, we didn't want to punch each other up and cause real damage, so we'd play wrestle. But, but the, the guys, they'd wrestle, they'd sort of subconsciously play by the rules. When I'd fight my female friends, particularly my cousin and my niece, um, my niece being only one year younger than me, by the way, and usually a niece is much younger, but my brother kept having kids. Um, anyway, um, yeah, they would just go crazy. Like, they, they'd be laying on their back on the floor or something, just kicking and screaming and scratching and biting. I'd be like, what do I do to that? I, you know, I don't know how to handle it. Um, and that's what we train. That's, we need to train against that kind of concept. Okay, another concept that you miss out on when you put in the blocks, the, the B-side blocks, is the Dimac side of things. When I'm, when I'm doing my strikes, I'm subconsciously training my body where to strike with, with all the small sounds out. Um, so again, if, if, if Lee blocks my hand across as I do it, my hand's not gone anywhere near his neck. Energetically, I have not felt that, even though I'm not physically hitting him in the neck, <coughs> energetically there is a connection between my palm and his neck. I can feel the heat of his neck. I can almost feel that pulsating... Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is what we've got to train in, to train our dim mac. You can't train dim mac by reading a book and learning where the points are. You have to physically train where the points are. And you've got to do it under pressure. Most people who train dim mac, they're like, okay, stand there. Oh yeah, 
oh yeah, this kind of thing. You've got to obviously train it under pressure, and that's what the small sand sounds for. So I've got this huge, big, lamping punch coming in at me, and I've got to still, wow, still got to get that strike to work without killing him, of course, without hitting him, but train the accuracy, the fudging, the snap on the end of the strike. As soon as he stops me, I don't get any DIMAC training coming out of that. Another area with regard to the DIMAC, the subconscious training of the body, which I see a lot of, again. Now this has been said a hundred times over on every single Small Sounds Out video or lesson that's ever been taught, at least by me or dad. I can't speak for all the other teachers in the world who teach it. Um, the concept of always hitting the right point. Now, of course, if Lee blocks my hand across, he's blocking my hand across, so it's not hitting the right point. That's a different way of training. I then, of course, need to learn what to do after that. Um, oh, that's another thing with regard to the small Santa, just another little thing, another video I need to do at some point. If he does put that block in, I need to learn how to fold and come back, and that's the folding principle. Don't just ever think of it as one strike. It's like you may have heard of something called the mother applications. The mother applications are what to do after the technique, because all the small sansao, every posture in the small sansao is initial attack every time. You're not fighting, having a fight. It's always that initial confrontation. That's the small sansao. Each strike is a new attacker coming in at you. Um, so, mother application is you've done the first what should we do next into the movement but then you have the other side of the coin what should you do next if your first movement doesn't work and that's probably more likely that will happen in a depending on how skilled the, the guy is who is attacking you so you've got what to do if your first one lands okay my natural follow-on would be that but then if, say, you just slap it in, for example, then my follow-up might be this, for example. So you've got a series of follow-on applications for what if it doesn't work. And that gets you into the folding principle with regard to the small sensor. <clears throat> anyway, back to what I was saying initially, striking the correct point, always. It doesn't matter if he's going to do his B-side and block me. I'm slamming at the right point, even though he will take my hand out of the way in it, like, at the end anyway. But particularly when he's not putting in the blocks, I must be always aiming at the correct points at all times. Train my subconscious to go for those points. It is all right to hit away from a pointed target for a very, very small percentage of your overall training. Okay? How you train is how you will fight. If you train to hit here, Every time you practice the small sensor, you get into a fight, you'll hit here. Your subconscious will hit the point you're trained to hit. Remind me to go into more detail of that after this section. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, if Lee throws the, the swing punch <coughs> and I strike him in the shoulder, right? Now, a lot of people think, oh, that, I like that because I get a more realistic effect because I can physically hit something. It's more realistic in feel, it's not more realistic in what you'll actually do in the street because you are training your body now to do that. So. You train nine times out of ten to the real point. Then, on your tenth round, you go, I better just check I can actually deliver power. Throw the punch, boom, and really smash him in the shoulder hard. And you can do, you apply that principle to anything. If the punch is, I don't know, let's say the punch is to CV14, I don't want to punch him full power in CV14, so I might just punch him in the belly. Because, I mean, he can take a certain amount of power. Um, to his belly. So that's the idea. You can hit other points just purely to check. It's not a training exercise. It's a test. But you do not then go, oh, that was all right. Let's do that for the next hour. Because then you're subconsciously training yourself to hit the shoulder. So as soon as you go, oh, that was a bit crap. Right, I better practice that some more. <clears throat> and I'll go back to practicing on the neck again. I will not sit there practicing it on the shoulder. If I want to practice the striking elements of my small sensor. You get the mitts out, you get a punch bag out. Boom! Practice on the bag. Because when you're practicing on a bag, nothing's going into your subconscious because there's not a body in front of you. It's a kick bag. Your movement is going into your subconscious, of course, how to move, but striking location, nothing's going into your subconscious because you've got nothing to reference to, you see? Um, even if, for example, I sometimes do that, I'll get a kick bag, a hanging kick bag, I'll hide behind it and throw a punch at my partner so he can aim at the, at the bag. 
That way you actually get a more realistic effect anyway because you're still hitting centre line instead of off centre line, which is how you have to hit when you hit the shoulder. Um, but now, it is still a bit different. The distancing is going to be a little bit different and so on. But it's very different in the way that it goes into your subconscious because you're hitting mitts. You're doing something that is so not fighting that it doesn't go into your subconscious. If I start, for example, punching a mitt, he at least holding a mitt for me and I'm punching a mitt, that doesn't mean I get into a fight and go, <laughs> start punching him in the head. Because my mindset, I've got no aggression coming forwards, you see? That's the importance. If he is standing there completely static, holding a mitt for me, I've got nothing to feed off. Nothing is causing my body to want to hit him. So I can stand there and practice all my strikes of the small sand cell, which you should of course do as well. Take out some mitts or a punch bag and practice every single one of your small sand cell strikes because the defensive actions you practice with your partner. The strikes you have to do on a bag because you can't hit your partner. But as soon as he does anything towards me, ah, there, now I have to program my body to go for the real strike. 90% of the time, 10% of the time, yes, okay, you can hit the shoulder once just to make sure that you can actually do the two with power. Because you might find you hit the bag really well, but then you come back to, oh, I'm focusing on this now and I don't get power here. Or I'm focusing on this now and I get hit or something. So you may not be getting both the coordination working together. So that's very, very important. Hello, hello. Oh, and on top of that, what I was saying about um, testing your power by hitting the shoulder in the small sand cell only as a test, never as a constant training method, the same rule applies to, for, for me anyway, uh, to putting on boxing gloves. So even though, as I've explained, the boxing glove will change the way you strike, and so it's not good to practice with them all the time, it is a good little test for you, just to make sure that under pressure, while you're sparring, you can actually deliver physical power in your strikes. Because you might find you, you know, you sort of think you're delivering good power, and you can on a bag, on a static object, but under speed and pressure when you're moving in a sparring environment, you might find that when you're punching, you've got no power. So that's one reason it is good to put a pair of boxing gloves on and really try to make sure you can smack your partner good and hard just to make sure you are actually delivering the power. The, the basic rule is though, for me, from a self-defense point of view, is to make sure that when you do put on the boxing gloves and spar in any manner with boxing gloves, is to make sure that you don't change the way you fight because of the boxing gloves. That's what will hinder your self-defense ability. It's not the, so much the training with the boxing gloves, it's changing the way you, you train. So for example, as I've already explained, the boxing glove, if I hit the same way I would hit without the boxing glove, the boxing glove stops the damage being done. So therefore, I can change the way I strike to better suit the glove. But then if I go back to empty-handed, I'm, I'm not going to be as good at striking. Um, so yeah, if you want to train for self-defense as opposed to for competitions, then of course you want to actually use the boxing gloves to test yourself to make sure you've got power, but still strike in the same way and to the same points, same areas of the body as if you were fighting uh, empty-handed. Um, and then you can use that as a test without hindering your self-defense ability um, rather than training yourself to do it the competition way that will better suit your competitive uh, style. Okay, realism in training. What I've just spoken about, about correct target, to be real, right? Now, I've had some other martial artists, your MMA guys, your boxers, people who train with gloves and physically hit each other when they train. They regard that as being more realistic because you're physically hitting. You're not pulling it short, you see? However, it's like this. We've got more realism in the sense that you're using the correct weapons and that you're striking the correct points. They've got more realism in the fact that they're physically hitting each other. However, they don't get the correct points because they can't hit each other in the neck still. They have to hit the correct portions of the body to not do too much damage. So they're then taking away the training of hitting the groin, hitting the neck, and this kind of thing. Um, also, they're learning how to fight with gloves on. And the way you punch with the glove on, especially a boxing glove, even a smaller MMA glove, the way that you form your fist and punch, the way you structure your fist and wrist, is very different to the way you do without the glove on. Uh, there is always danger of hurting your hand when you get into a real fight. However, 
when you practice to hit without gloves on, you've got less chance at least. Even people like Mike Tyson, now he's huge, he's massive, big strong hands. He's been in real fights, street fights, so he still knocked the other guy out, but he broke his hand. So even someone with big strong hands like that who punches for a living can break his hand. So what we've got is not just the way we form the fist, um, the way we structure the fist, but also the way you deliver the power. A classical boxer's punch, I'm not talking about your, your jabby punch here, I'm talking about your knockout punch, it has that effect that you're hitting and going through the target. So two reasons that this can really damage your hand. A, you're going through the target. When we do our, our strikes anywhere to the face, not so much to the body, then we go in a bit deeper, but anywhere to the face, anything hard, it's this, it's surface strikes. But when it's just the knuckle, you only need that superficial edge. You hit the nerve, you don't need to push his head over here. See, with a glove on, you're not affecting the nerves, the, the direct targets. You're affecting this. You're affecting the spine, the neck. That's what causes the knockout. The twist in the neck is what causes the knockout, not the actual point that you're striking. Um, so, of course, do that with a boxing glove on, and it does nothing to your partner. I've, I've done it myself. I've sparred with boxers and you know kickboxers and things like that. I've put the big gloves on, and I've gone... I've done a really good punch, and he's just going... Pff. What was that? There's nothing, because you can't penetrate. A far jing strike, a, a shallow depth far jing strike, only penetrates that far, and that's how thick the glove is. So the glove absorbs all the power, so you will not deliver anything. So what happens is, because you're not delivering any power, we change the way that we strike. So we go, oh, well, that didn't work. I better punch him like this. By punching like that, you're now changing your mechanics, your subconscious movement of how you punch. Therefore, you get into a fight, whoom, and you're going to punch like that straight through the target and possibly break your own hand. Not only the depth perception side of things, but also the target. If, say, for example, I just go swing a punch without care for my hands, without cur uh, not curiosity, courtesy, that's the wrong that's word. Wrong as well. I feel like I should go like this. Yeah, exactly. Um, caution. That's caution. The word. Caution. Yeah, yeah, a, Without caution yeah, to, my, yeah. Yeah, to my hands. If I throw a punch, let's say I throw a punch like this, right? Bang. Now that's a nice landing punch. You see, going straight up into his mind point. That's going to land nicely because I've got caution in my hand. I'm being pedantic about how I'm punching or kick it up like that or under the nose like that. These kind of things. If I just swing a punch in without caution, which is how a boxer will punch, because they don't have to worry about the, the protection of the hand. And I hit the jaw like that, I've hit that lovely big jawbone right between the knuckle. That's gonna break my hand. The, the little bones in the hand are not that strong, even if you're a big guy, as I said, even big strong boxers have broken their hands when fighting in a, in a realistic situation. So, generally speaking, we shallow punch to the face head areas when punching empty-handed. Um, and we hit the points that are going to cause maximum damage to him and minimum damage to me. So we, we strike in here to the soft portion. We don't just swing a punch to wherever. If you're in a situation where, just like, like you were saying before, psychotic situation, use your palm. I only ever th swing a punch at someone when it's like bang, bang, bang. He's set up. I've already hit him. Now I've got a perfect shot. You see? I would never lead with a punch. Um, unless maybe he was just like coming in with a punch like that then it's like, oh there yeah. it is lovely bang I can then do a punch but what I mean is if I feel like what the hell's going on punches kicks coming everywhere I'll keep my hands open I will not close my fists I will keep my hands open because if I do that I can throw that in any direction I want and not hurt my hand I mean of course there's always chance you can hurt your hand in some aspect but there's a lot less chance that you could hurt your hand so uh, that wasn't the main thing I wanted to talk about. Realism. What's more realistic, training like this or training with boxing gloves? Okay, there's an argument for both sides. To some degree, I believe that you should do both. The way that we're hitting with Fa Jing is transference of energy, which is the principle of physics. So I'm putting the whip effect of my body and to a degree, a large amount of my body weight into him and the speed that I'm going at. I can't remember which law it's. It's uh, speed times acceleration equals, but it's energy yeah. transference. Um, I'm not slating boxing, I box train myself. Um, I have done over the years. Um, 
the way that we hit and train as well as I was talking to in the uh, Tai Chi for Health, the way that we hit things is stimulating something called osteogenesis in our hands, which is good for you for health, but it also gives you denser bone structure and you're less likely to break or get um, what we call uh, green stick fractures or fractures on the center of the bone from pushing type strikes or hitting harder objects. So because we're whipping, we're causing the transference of energy and having uh, less depth in our strike. And again, because we've done a lot of bare hand training, we've got the osteogenesis, which has made all our bone structure hopefully denser um, as we've trained through our life. That's why in Japan you start off with bags of hay, you go up to maize, you go on to sand, then you start hitting wood, then you sink the wood into the floor, then you go on to makawaras. Um, whereas in the West we've looked at people breaking boards and thought that makes you tough. Mm. It's not, no. You build up to that over years and years of hitting things of a different density to give yourself osteogenesis. So when we're transferring energy into somebody when we're hitting, I'm not talking about Harry Potter magic, I'm talking purely about the laws of physics and physiology. Um, and then the laws of physiology then is we're having osteogenesis, so we have slightly denser bone structure, um, which is used to taking that barehanded impact. Mm. Yeah, very nice. Um, so one other thing I was going to say is subconscious training. Now, your, your gloved martial artists will say, they'll use our own argument against us. So we always say in the, in the traditional martial arts that if you practice to hit, say, the chin instead of the eyes or instead of the neck, or you practice to hit the belly instead of the cock or something like this, that's going into your subconscious and you will do that in a fight. So, your gloved martial artists often use that argument against us. <coughs> They'll say, okay, well, you're practicing to hit these real targets, but you're practicing to not hit them because we're not making contact. And that is a valid argument. That's a totally valid argument. So every time we train, boom, I just punch like that. And I, I missed the target by that far. I'm still pro, I'm still doing all the correct body movement. I'm still delivering that power, but I'm not physically hitting him. Now, I haven't got any scientific reports to tell you about. All I've got is personal experience. When I have practiced any kind of sparring work with uh, competitive style martial artists, where they're, they're punching to you know, leave out the neck and the eyes, this kind of thing, and I tell them, okay, when you do that particular punch, aim here instead of here. Like, I'll just give them a different target. And sure, if I say, okay, here I come, I'm gonna attack you, he'll, he'll be able to aim at that point, because he's thinking about it. But then we go, okay, let's go back to sparring now, bang, 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 bang start getting it on a free flow level and he'll go straight back and start hitting the point that he is programmed to hit. And I've seen it in myself as well. Because the target you hit with a glove on has to be different than the target you hit without a glove on. Not just because of the rules of combat, the rules of uh, the competition, uh, to protect the other person. You also have to hit to a different point to cause more damage as well. So for example, um, okay, let's say I'm not allowed to hit the groin because that causes too much damage, so I have to hit the body. However, with the facial point of view, I'm allowed to hit anywhere, anywhere roughly, like around, I'm not allowed to hit the back of the head, but I'm allowed to hit anywhere down through here, and I don't know if you're allowed to hit the neck in boxing, because the glove's basically too big to hit the neck anyway, so you can't really, I don't know if it's actually a law. I know in um, MMA you're not allowed to hit the neck, because the glove is small enough to get into the neck. But anyway, if you punch, if, for example, Let's say you come in with a, with a straight jab there, and I can what that positioning. Last time I was sparring with a, a Muay Thai fighter, he would do that. That's where I found myself in several occasions. And I landed this same strike several times. But I wanted to punch him. Just go that side so they can see. I wanted to land it straight in the back of his jaw, right in there. But I had the boxing glove on, and it was a 10-ounce boxing glove. Not a huge one, but not an MMA one, but a fairly decent size one. And I went... Boom, and punched him with a good snappy farging strike. And of course, it did nothing to his body. You might say, oh, but yeah, it wouldn't do anything even if you didn't have the glove on. Yeah, well, just do that to your friend just with no power at all right there, and you'll go, oh, yeah, that would definitely work. There's no question, would it work or would it not work? 
I have been hit there in training by accident and it has put me to the floor. Um, so even though we don't try to hit each other in these points because it causes so much damage, it does still happen. Sometimes you don't pull your shot close enough. Same with the neck. I've been, you know, I've been struck in the neck or my, my wife got me on the uh, stomach 11 one time with a slap down like that and it didn't knock me out but I did go, whoa, like my you know, stars came up and I was quite dizzy. I had to sit down. She's brutal anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, speaking from personal experience, I then said to myself while sparring with this guy, okay, every time I hit him, I keep hitting him here, this region here, which the glove spreads out and therefore doesn't do any damage. I would be much better off hitting him here on the tip of the chin because that twists the head more. Now, from a non-glove point of view, hitting here is more damage to your own hand. That's why I don't like hitting there. But I couldn't do it. I could not cause myself to... I, I would say every time I'd go, bang, I'd go, oh, wait, no. I, I'll, I'll hit him on the chin next time. Da, 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 da. And sure, if he just stood there, I'd be able to hit him on the chin. But because the only time someone is open to a shot is when they're attacking you. If he's got his guard like this, I can't hit him on the chin now. He's got his glove there. I have to wait for him to attack. And we, oh, I've got to move instantly, subconsciously. In which case... Because I'm moving subconsciously from a reactive point of view, bang, I've, all, I've instantly gone back to the correct target again, um, rather than hitting the jaw. So from my own personal experience, I couldn't change my movement to hit the best target with the glove on. So by that, I have a good assumption there that if you, by reversing that role, if you're trained to hit the chin, you're not gonna hit here, you're not gonna hit the eyes, Boom! You're not going to slap the groin. You're not going to hit those points under a subconscious reactive state. People think they can because they train drills and things. Or perhaps maybe they get attacked by some drunken pup going like this. Of course, under that situation, it's like, oh god, this guy's this guy's a bit, you know, um, off his face. You're not under pressure. You're not really reacting. You're not in any way in danger. So you can do whatever you want. You're thinking. When you're thinking about fighting, you're not really fighting, let's face it, it's not real self-defense if you have to think, if you're able to think about it. Um, in which case, of course then, you can pick any target you want. You stick your thumb up his bum if you want to do that. Um, but you will never be able to do it under a subconscious reflex of action. However, with regard to power, power delivery, again, because I've trained with the gloves on, even though it was the wrong kind of power for a glove, because as I say, it didn't go through, it just, it surface hit, but I never have had a problem with delivering power. So under that, whoa, what's happening? Subconscious reaction when someone's throwing an attack at me, when I've had the gloves on, boom, I've still delivered the power with correct depth and correct accuracy and hit with good physical power, whether it be the face or the body or whatever. Same with the kicks. When we kick each other, we don't kick full power into the body. But because we, you know, if you have protective gear on of some kind, so you can deliver the kick a bit harder, I will subconsciously put that kick in as hard as I need to for the situation. So by that effect, because I put the glove on and realized I could hit harder, um, therefore I know, I, you know, I can't say I know 100%, but I am pretty certain that in a real situation I would not go, oh my god, he's attacking me, boom, and not hit him. I'm 99% positive that I would still deliver that punch. And having said that, I admit, I've never been in a real life or death situation. Um, I've been in, you know, silly little things in pubs where, again, it's not real, real fighting because I've lived a very peaceful life. I've, I've not put myself in those situations where I've had to deal with that. No one's ever attacked me before. Um, whereas people like Lee and many other students that we have in the WTBA, instructors who train this stuff solely, they have been in real fights, street situations. In fact, we have several instructors in the WTBA who are, you know, in the army, police officers, uh, security ward, nursing people, um, all these kind of things who have to deal with violence on a day-to-day -day basis. And they have said that, it, it, you know, same thing. They, they don't get into a fight and go like this and not hit the guy. They still land those strikes. So as far as I'm concerned, if you train to not hit the strike, as long as you're using the correct body mechanics, you're not just going like this, you're boom, you're still delivering that power of your waist into the strike and you still feel that projection of physical energy transferring into your partner, then in a real situation you will still do it. Whereas targets, you cannot hit the wrong target in training.
So all I'm trying to say is with reference to power, you can lessen your power in training and it's still completely natural to up your power in a realistic situation. Whereas targets, you have to train to the correct target. Train the wrong target and you will hit the wrong target in your realistic fight. <clears throat> Glove fighting, you're also not stimulating something called your panic response. And it's your panic response where everybody talks about flight and fight, nobody ever talks about freeze. Freeze is a natural part of the adrenal response. Adrenaline is there to cause you initially to run, fight, or to freeze. Freeze comes from the, the job of adrenaline is to initially cause an increase in your internal body rates. So you can run or you can fight hard straight away instantly or it causes peripheral vascular constriction. So that means it shuts down the blood supply, go into your arms and your legs and you do literally freeze. Now this is there because in nature in the, the panic response is a bit more complex than that and in Tai Chi for Health Volume 3 I'm going to go into the panic response quite, um, quite, quite in depth. But initially in nature, if I'm being attacked by Eli the Sabretooth Tiger or Eli the Warrior who wants to kill me, I've either got to fight him or run straight away. If there's a pause, it means I've been attacked by the Sabretooth Tiger or I've been attacked by the Warrior who's potentially destroyed me. Therefore, my body wants to keep the blood to my internal organs to keep me alive. If I'm bleeding heavily, if I've taken a massive shock, if I've gone into cardiac, uh, well, not cardiac arrest, but if, if I'm compromised internally, my body doesn't want to waste blood in my arms and in my legs. It wants to keep the blood to my internal organs. So we have flight or fight, but people don't like to talk about freeze because apparently that's cowardism or something, and it's not. It is a natural part of your adrenal response. If you don't go straight away or go straight away, you will stop mm. because you have less, very minimal amounts of blood to your arms and your legs because adrenaline has caused peripheral vascular shutdown, which is why we give adrenaline to people when we're resuscitating them. It doesn't start their heart. It shuts down the blood supply to their external organs, uh, to their external limbs, so we have more blood to work with in the thoracic cavity to try and get their heart to go. So effectively, if, it, if you don't use it in this way or yep. that way instantly, instantly, it will shut you down. It will shut you down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's, so that's why for. you've got to have yep. what we always say. Don't stand there thinking about yep. it. No. It will move instantly, yep. whether that be running away or, yep. and as a general rule, if we're here, don't run away. Because obviously I'm, I'm too close. He's going to he's gonna catch me and yeah, punch me in the absolutely. back of the head. If, if I'm over where the camera is and I see some dude pull a knife, I'm off. Go on. You know, if, you, if you're further than you know, 20 feet or something, run like, assuming you think you can run fairly okay, you know, if you're, if you're older or something, you might have a better chance fighting. But, um, oh, I, I always say, a lot of people always say, oh, I don't need martial arts, I just always run away. Well, hey, no, if you're this close, you can't yeah. run away. Uh, you're in a pub, whatever, you can't run away. Mm -hmm. Also, what, what happens if you're out with your mum? <laughs> exactly. Or, or your yeah. pregnant wife. My mum's got a bad hip. See you later, honey. <laughs> My mum's got a big <laughs> pregnant belly. You know? yeah, You're not going to run away, are you? Yeah. So you, you got yeah. it. Yeah. You, there's always going to be those situations. So if he, Eli and I are training at a high level, I'm going for him and he's reacting and we know we've got a little bit unsafe. Mm. We're stimulating that panic response. You know, you, you feel it. <laughs> when I ring fight, when I, I, I ring fight with, with MMA fighters or, or when I trained with boxers in the past and don't get me wrong a lot of these guys have knocked me down yeah. you know um, that level of danger hasn't been there there's been safety in mind mm -hmm. you know there's safety in mind when we're training at a high level yeah. but we, I, Eli knows if I throw a punch at him it's gonna tear his head off if he doesn't stop it most of the time mm -hmm. I know when he's reacting to me if that actually lands I'm going down because of the energy transference the, the, the faging, the, the, the way, the violence of the body movement in faging. I know I'm going down if I get hit by it. Whereas when I'm sport fighting, the fitness is great. Getting used to physical contact, getting yeah. used to somebody this close to you. Mm -hmm. in, especially the wrestling stuff. Especially the wrestling stuff. It's, it's almost invaluable in your training, mm. but you need to up the ante a little bit. You need to have that danger. You need to stimulate the panic response. And especially when you've got somebody, you know, I've had people running at me in my job who've eaten their own face. They are psychotic. They're covered in their own blood and feces and they're screaming that are attacking you. And you've just got to react. Yeah. If you don't react, you freeze, you get torn to pieces. And another same concept, but even from a... <laughs> 
That's a good hole, Alan. He's, he's a very nice good hole. He's an industrious chap. Must be you know, he's for the squirrel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the squirrel's up the tree. <laughs> um, energetically, you don't necessarily. Sure, you know, when Lee and I train together, you know, there are times we have to go like, hold on a second, I need to sit down for a bit because, you know, because of the strike. You do, you know, you will take strikes. However, even with a more beginner student, when I'm training, you know, say, say my wife, for example, now I'm not going to physically knock her out and punch her in the face, but I'm going to give her the same energy as if I were going to. And people think, oh, ha, 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 yeah, this doesn't do anything, but it does. I've taken so many, um, not necessarily pro fighters, but your, your younger guys who are studying MMA or wrestling or something, by where the way that they spar, even though it's free sparring and they have to react, you know, they're not sure, it's not a set training technique. Um, but they're still sparring like, yeah, cool, let's do it, man. There, boom, boom. Yeah. You know, they might be physically hitting yeah. each other quite hard, harder than what we might hit each other. But their attitude is we're having a play yeah. and it's totally different. And I've tested this several times. Again, as I say, not a pro fighter. A pro fighter knows how to deal with aggression as well. But in, in that first, you know, your first few years of training, and I, I did it to a kid in Australia a couple of years ago, last year, I think. Um, and I, I, I think it was small sand sour, in fact, we were doing it. I was swinging my punches at him. He was about, I think he's 17 or something. But he's a strong young boy, and he could do his small sand sour really, really well, really solidly. And I was throwing as hard as I possibly could punches at him, and he was grounding it. He'd been training with his dad. He was doing really, really well. And then I said to him, OK, there's a very important area of your training and I said, okay, I'm going to throw the same punch at you, right? And I want to see how you react. And he's like, oh, yeah, cool. You know, he was still again, like, oh, yeah, this, this is great. Yeah, I love this training. And I went, oh, 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 like this, and just, oh, just did that to him. And his whole, you, the look in his eye just went, <laughs> he completely froze. He metaphorically shat his pants. Um, and he just said afterwards, whoa, that was... I, I've never felt that before, even though I didn't even physically hit him very hard. All I did was grab him by the collar, showed him that aggression, and you know, physically what I did, I went like this and pulled my hand back like this. He had all the time in the world to stop the punch, but because I gave him aggression and made him think I was going to knock his head off, he then, I mean, he still put his hands up, but he, yeah, his whole body went from this really good forward intent, and he just shriveled in his stance. And so that's what we have to train people at, even though it's not physically real. And that's why it's good to train with different people. I can train, for example, every time my dad would ever attack me would be like that. But there comes a point where you get to know that person. And I know deep down that's not really going to physically you know, beat me to the ground and hurt me. So then it's good to train with someone else. So then I train with Lars Eric, who's bigger than me physically. That tends to make it uh, have more of an effect if the person's physically outsizes you. Um, so he's able to do it to me more. Like, even if you do it, I train with you quite regularly. So if you give me all that violence, yeah, whoa, it's still nice, it's still really violent and everything, but deep down I know you love me. So it, it, that subconscious thing of I know he loves me is still there. Whereas because I train with Lars Eric less often, even though consciously, yes, I know Lars is not going to physically want to hurt me and stomp on my face once I hit the floor, but subconsciously, I don't know that. My subconscious body still goes, God, this guy's going to kill me. And so it's fantastic training for me to make sure I still do the right thing. Anyway, last thing I just want to say, very quick little thing. Distancing in your small sand sound. Um, we always talk about distancing. But I realized recently that people hadn't been, it's something I've never spoken about. And I've realized I've always done it. But I've realized a lot of students don't do this particular concept. So we always say, okay, right, make sure you can physically hit your partner. Don't do your small sounds out here where, you, where you're missing each other, right? And of course don't do it here because that, that's, you know, that particular technique won't work at that distance. However, what's never been really put down in, you know, properly in classes or workshops is that the distancing for each strike has to be different because they're not all the same kind of attacks, are they? So I've, I've realized myself the other day, I was at a workshop and I've realized myself readjusting my body. And of course, a lot of other people do that subconsciously, but the people who don't know how to fight and they're just learning small sand sour, they don't do that subconsciously. So I thought it'd be important for me to actually say that. So say, for example, the first move, for starters, the very first move, people think, 
Ooh, that, that feels a bit too close. Well, actually, it is too close because this is not how I punch. I punch like this. Now look where I'm reaching. I've turned my shoulder. Now I can reach way back here. So you've got to say to yourself, okay, the punch I am offering is a long range punch. So in which case I can now reach him at that particular point. So always make sure that this, not just, don't just go, okay, that's good. And then stay at that distance for the whole day, like for the whole sequence. For example, after that one, go for the, that one, yeah. Now here, I feel like, I mean, I can reach him, but I'm a little bit too far away. That's a short range punch. That's a come in and get in punch, you see? So that, I have to go, bang, I've got to come in, see, just a little adjustment of my foot. Just a slight adjustment, that will give him the realistic effect, instead of me being over here. It'll give him more realistic effect also for the follow-up. Now he's got to do it very close range, where it should be. So he's not punching over here. Small sensei, you're punching right here. It's a very close form. Um, a couple of other ones, so just, just go through slowly the form, so there, double pung, that, that's the same strike. This is again, so th these low ones would all be the same distance. So bang, that would be the same, bang. See, now he gets a good idea of doing chi. If I had done that as a longer punch, like something like this, I'm a little bit out of range. See, so that doesn't make sense for him to do chi there. If he was that far away from me, he should have just punched me or yeah, done something else long range. But if I've come in close, oh, that's lovely. That's where you should use chi. So, when we train, again, my job as the B-side, and this applies to large Santao as well, it's my job to do the right thing to cause him to do the right thing. Because if we're free sparring and I do the wrong thing, well, he can adapt and do whatever he wants. So he can never do the wrong thing. I can never cause him to do the wrong thing because we're free sparring. It's only when we're doing set techniques like small Santao. So, I'm the teacher, I'm the B-side, Lee's a student, he's learning how to move. If I punch long like this, which yeah, technically I can touch him, but there wouldn't be much power in it, he doesn't realize, as a beginner, that I'm at the wrong distance. So he's gonna do, do the, the, the chi one, bang. He's now gonna obviously have to move in. So he's subconsciously training his body to use chi as a long distance attack, which is bad news, you don't wanna be doing that. So I'm, conditioning his body to do the wrong thing. So I have to move in whoa, here, now I'm conditioning him to do the right thing. Carrying on from there, this, this is the one that is the most important. This is the one that I noticed in a workshop I did recently. From there, we're very close, right? If I put, throw this next punch from here, this is crap. This, the, you don't want to use that technique at this range. You could use just the into the neck movement, but you look at where my arm, let's just do it the other side so the camera can see. If I'm this close to him, He's not gonna get this strike. This strike is supposed to be into heart three, right? That's, that's what you're aiming at. Um, now, if I'm out here, this is where we're actually using this strike. Just don't block for a second. Yep. This is what I'm aiming for, straight on his nose or in his neck or something like that. So basically I can reach his ear. If I can reach his ear, that means it would have been a good punch on his nose, right? Um, indicating that would be a nice open position. If I were like this, he wouldn't try to use a strike to the inside of my arm. So you've got to assume the correct movement, the correct attack to force your partner to do the right thing. If I happen to be close and coming through here, he should attack straight to my neck. He shouldn't bother with the arm. But if I'm out here, especially because I'm taller than Lee, I've got a longer reach than he does, he might find it's a lovely technique to whack that first, jolt my body and then attack into the neck. So you're distancing. Always restart your distancing for each attack. Of course, some of them, like first three or the, the low ones, they're going to be the same distance. But don't stay at the same distance for the whole form. Um, so basically, I'm not going to tell you everything. Figure it out. Just be in a position where you know you can deliver power. If you were here, would you do that? Well, no. I don't particularly. This doesn't feel very good. I might do this. Or I might do, I'd, I'd probably use an elbow if I was that close. If he'd just done chi, bang. Whoa, this, whoa, this works. This, this is a crappy punch. So I'm going to get hit by Chi. Ugh. See, now it fits. That's a nice movement now. It makes sense for him to do the movement. Basically what I'm saying is you never want your partner to practice a technique when it doesn't make sense to do so. Um, even though the small sensor is not a fighting application, it's a training method to teach your body how to move. Never use your small Santao in a fight. Anyone who says to you, I don't like that form, the small Santao would never work in a street fight, agree with them. Say, well, no, the small Santao would not work in a fight. Push hands wouldn't work in a fight either. 
Um, punching a speedball wouldn't work in a fight. Walking with a clothesline bobbing up and down underneath it, that wouldn't work in a fight. But it's training your body in certain aspects of movement. That's what the small sound sao is. It's not meant to be used as the technique for the fighting situation. Techniques don't work in fights. Exactly, yeah. Fighting works in fights. Exactly. <laughs> um, however, even despite the fact that you're not going to use the specific technique, you're still training your body to react correctly under certain situations. So I have to be able to portray that certain situation to cause him to do the right thing. Otherwise, I'm training him to do the wrong thing in any given situation. So that's why that distancing thing is so important. And as I mentioned very in the, in the beginning of this video, even though the small sensei, you will bang, 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 you'll, you know, you'll keep it flowing, you don't stop after each movement. The attitude from me is that I'm a new attacker each time. So, this is shown obviously in the first three attacks. So, I do the first attack, bang! I don't go like this, same one again, bang, bang. That's not how we practice small sensei. Because, why would I ever do that? And why would he ever do that? If I was attacking with two punches, he should do his mother application. So I should go bang, bang, you see? Before I've had a chance to throw that second one. <laughs> Missing up my hair. I know, yeah. <laughs> um, so what the, the attitude is, is very clearly stated in the first movement, in the, the dropping of the hands. So I swing that punch in, boom! It's not just the doer who does it, the puncher must do it as well. Now, new attacker, I'm a new aggressor. Boom! Drop. The second one though, now, now we're assuming same attacker. So there's, there's parts where it might be just two strikes as same attacker. So we think, bang, for whatever reason, maybe he missed. Maybe I didn't knock me out. That can happen. Even if you land your strike, I might not get knocked out. I might still be able to throw my second strike. So in this case, I don't go bang, stop, and then do the low one. I go, whoa, whoa, one movement, see? But then obviously he has to throw his attack. So that's the weight. That's naturally there, he's hit me, here comes the next one, bang, bang, he's hit me, new attacker again. Now, oh, now this one obviously, bang, that would be the same attacker, you see, because there's no follow-up until the second strike. These ones, let's see, I'm adjusting myself backwards, what, bang, new attacker, what, bang, new attacker, what, bang. Um, this one will be the same attacker, yeah, bang, so we're assuming on that third round, bang, bang, wah, we're coming straight in. Even though he has hit me, I'm still staying at the same distance. Um, following on from there, these ones are obvious, he's twisting me down. This is obviously, you, you know, obviously I've got to release my hand and come through with the next attack. Bang. This is quite obviously a new attacker. You see, I'm not going like from here, sort of, you know, to try to grab him from here. I'm releasing my body and attacking from the front. That's what I'm doing. Um, same again, new attack. Bang, wow. Anytime I get hit, really, like a, a fully substantial strike, I'm getting hit, I'm getting knocked back. So, bang, same thing, bang. Uh, we're on the wrong side, I think. We are on the wrong <laughs> side of me. <laughs> bang, yeah. Small, yeah, now single whip. Yeah. So, same thing, bang, new attacker, wow, wow. Boom, new attacker coming in, wow. Locks the arm out, obviously a new attacker, bang. What bang, he's taking me out, bang, what bang, last one, bang, same attacker. See, because I've got to attack him when he's attacking me. Never do the tackle after he's done the strike. So if, if you do that, that final strike there, yeah. yeah, if I go take the shot, now this is the same thing I was saying before. I'm going to attack low and you're going to hit me on the back of the head. So you're in that position and you're going to hit me on the back of the head. Now you might think, oh yeah. Nothing wrong with that technique. Why didn't he punch me in the face? See, why did I'm, I'm here? Why doesn't he hit me now? Before? Why does he wait until my head's down here to hit me on the back of the head? Well, I give him a reason to do that. So if we're here, we should always be hitting to the front. But if he throws that last strike, what? You see? As he does his final strike, when he's open, so I'm not giving him a chance to hit me in the face. I'm ducking so I'm only offering him the back of my head. He has no chance to hit me in the front. That's why that tackle move at the end must be done as the sand sour does his final technique, not afterwards. Um, 
Yeah, so that's the general idea, just as I say, just some random tips and bits and bobs that are not particularly in videos. Or they might be in the videos, but they're just mentioned once and it sort of passed by a little bit. Some important aspects that you need to be training um, and how to train them and when to train them and so on. Um, yeah, sound good? Yeah, 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 cool. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. Enjoy yourself. We'll try not to slip out on our way down. <laughs> Thank you. Good boy. Side of a low punch down over this. Oh, yeah, that there will do, yeah. Bang! Bang. Now you can throw a punch with this hand, see? Bang, bang! So I take it out again. I'm going to take his wrist and smash him in the face. Umbrella's here, we're still tough. So Eli's throwing the punch here, and <coughs> straight into his neck or into his eyes. Visualization and intent. It's got nothing to do with, just get Eli in. Chi Zhao, push hands, especially Chi Zhao. <laughs> Chi Sao, would you take this coat off, please? I don't want to rip my th finger up your coat. Chi Sao teaches us that I'm to... seeing, and that's that's true internal visualization. Thank you, Ben. In uh, Wu Dang, hmm, crushed tomatoes with basil. That's all it is. No additives. Organic, yep, no sugar, gluten-free, rich in lycopene, suitable for vegos. That's us. In it goes. There are eight small methods that we teach. Whoa. Look at that. Well, that's your lesson. And if your training turns out as well as this, then I'll tell you something, you're really going well. Hang on. I've got to give the cook salute here. None of this martial arts rubbish. Thank you.